on this episode of Damsels in the DMs. I think the thing that you can't teach someone is that they have something to say in a voice. And that could be in drama, that could be in comedy, it could be whatever. But I think when you're asking about the transition from short to feature, it's less technical. It's more, oh, the recognition that this filmmaker is ready to say something bigger. This message is intended as a reminder that we are not licensed professionals, not psychiatrists or psychologists. If you have a serious problem, please seek professional help. The National Suicide Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. There's some damsels in the DM. Yes, queen. <laughs> Tell us what's the vibe. Uh-huh. What's the vibe? There's some damsels in the DM. Yeah. Yeah. Please tell us what's the vibe. DMs, DMs, yeah we see them, yeah we read them. DMs, DMs, we don't need them, we just leave them. Please. Yeah. It's going down in the DMs. Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Damsels in the DMs. I'm Lauren. And I'm Alejandro. How are you doing, my friend? How was your holiday? Holiday was really fun, really special. It was. It was both restful and busy at the same time. So how was yours? It was good. I um, saw both my mom and my dad, so that was really nice. Um, got to go to visit Brian's sister in Chappaqua and see her baby. I always joke that I think I'm more of a dog person than a baby person. And every time I hang out with a baby, I prove myself wrong. So That's so adorable. I could so see you being so gentle and like playful with a baby. That's my it ended up being that like while everyone else is in the kitchen my job was to entertain the baby and like I never would have picked that role for myself but I was just having the best time I love that also too many cooks in the kitchen cannot be fun sometimes like true so, so true so what were you, doing? were you reading what was the activity that you found yourself most gravitating toward with the baby love the reading um she oh my god she kills me she loves my jewelry so she kept like wanting me to take my bracelet off and give it to her oh. and I mean, the, the girl has good taste right <laughs> and she would take the bracelet and then i'd give it to her and be like oh so pretty she's like so pretty and then I, she'd be like she 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 and i was like are you trying to say chic right now because you're right like you are so chic that is phenomenal <laughs> I'm like, you're one. Do you know how to say chic? But I think that's what you're trying to tell me right now. And then I would be like, okay, can I have it back now? Because it's like beads. I was afraid she would break it. And she would be like, mine. Mine. That is hilarious. Oh, my God. My parents have videos of me as a baby. I remember there's one, I think it was Christmas time. It was either Christmas time or birthday or whatever. But, like, there was uh, a point where I was un- I was opening a gift and... I had some, um, some uncles were messing with me and they were like, oh, that's mine. That's mine. And like the way that my younger self used eyes to like just show this like really like intense, like, no, it's mine. It was so, I mean, it was really funny, but it's funny how I guess mine is a universal word that all kids tend to gravitate towards. My favorite thing about kids is just how they're so like unapologetic, you know, because like when you get to be an adult, you're like, oh no, if you want that, like, go ahead. Like you have the first piece, you go first. Cause you're so afraid to offend people, you know, and at least I always put like others before myself on doing yeah. things. But as a kid, it's always just you, you, you. Absolutely. No filter, no, no filter. filter at all. Just like Nardeep, who was just uh, no bar. What's the expression? No, no bars held. No filter. No, no filter. No, I mean, how uh, just, open and honest he was with his experience in terms of starting and acting and growing as a writer, growing as a director. I'm blown away by all that he shared today. This episode was truly magical. And you met him at Bentonville, is that correct? Bentonville, we have another Bentonville person on the pod today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were some, there were a couple things that Nardeep said that I felt like are super motivational for people who are listening to this. And, you know, you might just be starting your career in the entertainment industry. He talked about how he had made 10 short films before he made his feature. And, you know, a lot of people make one short film and they're like, okay, this is the one that's getting me into Sundance. This is what's getting me into Cannes. But then he talked about like the short film he made, I believe it's called Bug. 
led him to meeting the producers who ended up helping him to make his feature land of gold i was lucky enough to see land of gold and it's incredible it's such a beautiful film his performance is amazing the little girl who also stars in the film is also incredible and he said that that was the eighth feature that he had wrote and again people write one feature and they're like okay this is my feature that i'm gonna sell and this is what's going to give me my career and i think it's so important that like the more repetition you put in is what allows you to actually have a career that takes off in this industry. Absolutely. Such a wise person and giving soul and just, yeah, just a really admirable journey that he's been on and an amazing trajectory he's on right now. So I'm really excited to see where his career goes. All right, everybody. Well, let's see what he's giving today. Let's get into it. Yes. All right. Well, hello, Nardeep. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to, uh, to, to talk. Yes. I believe that we last saw each other in LA, but we initially met at the Bentonville Film Festival where you had your screening of your film, correct? That is right. And you were screening your film, right? Yeah. We, yes, were, yeah. we were doing lots of screenings in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, which uh, is a surprisingly interesting place. I know. I actually really like that festival. Um, I thought Me that too. it was a really great experience. And, you know, yeah. who knew Bentonville, Arkansas would be the home of such a wonderful festival? Yeah. For all you listening, uh, to plug Bentonville has one of the best museums in the country. Uh, I think it's called Crystal Lakes or something like that or Crystal Rivers. It's like one of the most impressive art collections in that I've ever witnessed um, in the middle of Arkansas. It's wild. How did you have time to go there? Like through all of your screening and press and all the events? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've like made it a priority that if I'm going, like, you know, it, it's the privilege and, and the sort of the, the glamour of being able to do like the festival circuit with a movie. It's like, if you're going to a place you've never been, try and explore a little bit. So I, pe so many people were like, you gotta go there, you gotta go there. So I like made it my mission to go there for at least like two hours to uh, wow. see it, yeah. Good for you. I did not make it to the museum, but, you know, hopefully next time. <laughs> <laughs> and there will Wait, be a next so, time. Since I am new to your work and you, Nadeep, uh, hey. I would love to know a little bit more background as far as, you know, where you're from and what you do and, uh, you know, where you're located, but also, yeah, how you got started in filmmaking, too. All right. Yeah. Um, I'll try and cliff note this a little bit, but... Uh, so, uh, hi everybody. I'm Nardeep Kermi. I was born in Switzerland and uh, grew up outside the suburbs of Philly and like the, the white suburbs of Philly. And, you know, growing up as like, as a Punjabi American who also had like a big British influence who came from Switzerland, making friends was pretty difficult for me, particularly in these like white communities. And, uh, you know, I started playing music and then found performing, acting as like uh, a way in to make friends. I realized that if I could make people laugh, they wanted to beat me up less. So uh, I started making people laugh, got into performance, started doing like the school plays, musicals, did some community theater and all that kind of stuff. And um, I was very fortunate in my high school, we had this class called Video Applications where you know, they gave you a mini DV camera and taught you how to do basic editing on the computer. And it was like, okay, let's make short films, music videos, whatever. And I saw it as like a perfect marriage of my loves of photography. I, you know, I always used to take photos and develop them and, and performance. So I started making short films with my friends and I did this class. And uh, I remember it was my sophomore year or junior year of high school. I forget. Junior year of high school, we did Oklahoma, the musical. And I got cast as uh, Ali Hakim, as I played him, or Ali Hakim, as is more conventionally referred to as. And it just like hit me, like, why am I... In order to be a performer in this business, as a brown person, I'm so... Um, I'm relegated to what's available to me. And what's available to me was limited and not complex like i'm unless like the the, the production was going to be highly specific like they're never going to cast me as hamlet you know they're never going to let me play like these like really intense or funny or complex characters so i think that's where like my love of filmmaking in, in you know besides watching movies all the time but like my love of wanting to make films really started realizing i could tell the story myself and um I applied to mm -hmm. uh, college and it got into NYU. So I studied film at NYU, not acting. I figured I could act in people's films and, you know, 
keep it up there and do plays in the city if I wanted to, but learn different, uh, you know, screenwriting, directing, cinematography, editing, all that kind of stuff. And uh, graduated NYU in the recession, couldn't get a job, worked some really terrible graveyard shifts in New York, wound up finding myself in the fashion industry, was freelancing the fashion industry for almost 10 years, shooting and editing uh, content for magazines that went up online. Uh, the money started to dwindle and I was like, I really miss performing. So I started auditioning again, wound up finding a, a home in a theater out here in LA in the same way I found theater as a home in New York. Um, was doing a lot of um, 99 seat theater in LA and found representation. And then they started sending me out. And then I was able to make inroads acting and sort of like shift my career and the way I was paying my bills acting, which is like a very unique uh, thing. I feel I'm very fortunate to say that. And then basically anytime I was making a little bit of extra money, I put it back into my short films, rededicated it to the writing, the directing and uh, made a bunch of short films, a couple that did, you know, very well on the festival circuit internationally. And then that eventually led me to my first feature, uh, Land of Gold. That's, yeah, Cliff Notes. Hopefully that's okay. <laughs> Cliff Notes are good. We like abbreviations, but we're also here for a good tangent, too. So what was the transition from acting to directing? Like, or was it all just kind of like a, an evolution that just slowly snowballed? Yeah, you know, there wasn't like a a conscious switch of like, okay, today I'm going to do this thing. It was more like, it, like you, I think the way you said it, an evolutionary switch was a really, it was kind of how it was. It, it just sort of was like, this is going to be a way to give myself an opportunity to perform. And then it grew from that where I was like, oh, I don't want to be relegated just to things that I could perform. I want to be able to do things that like I can get my friends to do or like I have this crazy idea and I yeah. don't really care about being in it. And I love telling the story. I think the skill set, you know, I mean, if this is any indication, like in high school, I was student council president and class president and all that kind of stuff, very type A. So directing actually like fit that perfectly because like I could then be not in control, but I could help guide all of these different artists in telling the story, um, you know, with a point of view and with a perspective in a way as an actor, you kind of show up and you just do your job. You're a cog in the machine. It's a beautiful art, but it's just part of the art. Whereas with directing, you know, if you're writing, you're there from the very beginning of it till the very end of it. And like, as a director, you live with a project start to finish forever. Whereas with an act as an actor, at least I see it this way. Like I am, happier in rehearsals and in the process and i tend to not really care very much about the final product afterwards because it's sort of like yeah let's move on to the next thing so directing really like it like scratches that sort of um full completion itch um but yeah i know it was evolutionary it started more as a as a as a way to express myself in a more complete way and then wound up becoming you know the thing where i realized like oh this is longevity is here and and there's a different way to tell the story than just kind of participating as a as talent. Yeah. Do you direct your do you solely focus on directing the stuff that you've written or do you allow another person to come in as the director or how how do you balance that? Yeah. Uh if I write it, I direct it. If I direct it, it doesn't necessarily mean I've written it, but usually I'll have like my hand in the writing at some point, either like doing a revision on it or helping the writer and guiding them and like kind of notes adjustments type deal. And uh, I'm not acting in everything I do. It just happens that <laughs> the sort of more visible projects I've done recently, I've like written, directed and acted, but my, I, I would never want to be limited as a director just to the things I write. Cause I feel like that would be kind of boring. Um, especially like, as I try to stretch myself yeah. as a, as a, you know, artist. Right. Yeah. Nardeep, can you remind me which high school you went to in Philly? I forgot that we had this connection. Yeah, yeah. I will. So outside of Philly, uh, Downingtown right, right, High right. School. Yeah, Downingtown High School, and then we split our senior year, so I was Downingtown West. I see. Yeah, okay. and where, and where yeah, were you at? Friend Central. Yes, right. That's right. On City Ave, yeah. Yeah, one thing that I've always found really remarkable about your journey is that I feel like a lot of actors today kind of pick up writing, directing later in the game, you know, realizing exactly what you realize so early on that the roles can be super limiting because you don't have very much control over your acting career. But because you studied film in your undergrad, you already had that knowledge when you went back to acting later. What do you think that you have put into your acting from getting that education in film and how do you think that that's informed some of the decisions you make when you're in front of the camera 
That's a good question. Um, you know, I, my film background, my like behind the camera stuff has definitely informed me as a performer, particularly on camera, right? Because camera performing is different than stage performing. It's made me less precious. I think there's this thing mm. young actors tend to do where they show up on set. They really want to f give it their all, right? They want to like, yeah. it's, this is like, this is my chance. I'm going to be seen. I'm, everyone's going to see me this. I'm going to get cast and everything. But the reality is, mm. if you've ever worked on a set, you know, no one f cares. Like you are just a cog in the machine. I said that earlier, right? You're just a, you're just part of the process. And there's so much that comes before you and so much that comes after you. So I think, you know, me knowing all of that stuff that happens from start to finish as an actor, I go in and look at things not as like, this is my chance, but it's more like, ooh, how can I help tell this storyteller tell this story the best? How can I look at this character? How does this fit the script? How does this tell the narrative the best? Is it's not about me. It really isn't. Like, like if I get some catharsis out of what I'm doing, that's great. And that's just privately for me. But ultimately, you're trying to tell a story. So like, I never want to like get a character who may be villainous and be like, oh, how can I make, you know, obviously, how can I make them compassionate or whatever, but I'm not trying to make them not who they are and service the story, right? Like, I've heard some horror yeah. stories of, of, of actors showing up and trying to change the part because they don't want to, you know, come off this way or that way, or they don't want the, they want to be like received in a different way. And it's like, well, the beauty of performing is letting go and just being what the writing dictates you want to be and how the director interprets that. And like, you know, the performance style, right? Like w one of my favorite stories, he, Jack Nicholson's one of my favorite actors. And like, he's, yes. Oh my right? God. He's amazing. I love he's, him too. Yeah. He's incredible. And his performance style has varied wildly in his career, but you look at a movie like the shining, which I think he's objectively incredible in, but someone else could say he overacts, but like he and Kubrick and like that script, they dictated that this was what the film needed. And I think it's a masterpiece. So it's like, you know, knowing that as an actor who has been behind the camera has let me let go of my ego in ways mm -hmm. uh, and has forced me to let go of my ego where I'm like, okay, you know, I'm just here to help you tell the story as and use like my body, my voice as a vessel. And how can I best service the material? Because that's what it's about, right? Like when you're on stage as an actor, you're making very fine choices because you're repeating the performance every time. And you have like a month of rehearsal at least to really mine and find those moments. When you're on a film set, if you're lucky, you have rehearsal, but like you have takes. Um, I had an acting teacher here in LA, Stephen Book, who, who was like, treat every take as a rehearsal. So that was like a big thing for me. And I would like think of that as a director. I'm like, oh, right. I do want every actor to think of it as a rehearsal because I don't want you to repeat the same thing every time unless I ask you to do that. The reason we're doing takes is to get something different, unless it's like a camera problem and we have to do it again for those reasons. But the idea is like, give me something different that I can play with because what you're doing on set isn't the final performance. We're going to create the final performance in the edit. And knowing that has allowed me again to let go, not be so tight. And it's, it's, it's been a journey. Like, you know, when I was younger, my acting career definitely was much tighter, but now I feel much looser and much more like, you know, it's like when you see those actor round tables, like Kate Blanchett and like Joaquin Phoenix and Denzel Washington talking about the craft and getting in their body and all that kind of stuff. I feel like I'm finally getting to a place where I understand what they're talking about in a real way. Cause I'm starting to do that. And the feedback has been really great from other directors. They're like, Oh, you know, you're st you know, they enjoy working with me because, again, I'm not trying to step on their toes, but I'm doing my work privately and trying to fit that into what it is that they want and the conversations we've had. I I'm starting to ramble a little bit, but, I, you know. No, no, I, that was such a great answer. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's so true because I feel like as an actor, you feel like, oh, my gosh, there's so pressure, so much pressure on me to really nail this part. Like, I'm doing so much to tell this story. The film is riding on me. But really, like, you're there to serve whoever wrote the story, is directing the story, to serve their vision. So whatever you're doing, you are just helping them. And I think that that's such a great distinction on that. I'm curious for you yeah. because you mentioned that you started doing short films and then obviously I met you when you were taking your feature around the festival circuit, which did super well. Yeah. I want to hear a little bit about how you started transitioning from your shorts to your feature. Yeah. Um, randomly. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I had been making shorts for years to less success than I'd want. Um, you know, experimenting <laughs> with style and what I want to say and all that. And then the 2016 election happened and sort of things kind of clicked into gear for me in terms of like, hey, 
I have this privilege to be able to tell stories and I'm finding a way to make my living and live my life that way. Uh, as a Brown American, you know, hyphenate American, I think it's, it's a privilege, but it's also, there's a little bit of responsibility in terms of representation and what we're doing. So I made a film in response to the 2016 election uh, called Bug that's available on YouTube if you want to see that about a sick American on the 4th of July during, uh, you know, dealing with a lot of the brown phobia, for lack of a better term, that was <laughs> happening around the 2016 election and after. And I made that film not in a strategic way. I wasn't like, this is going to show off my acting. This is going to show off I'm a great director or I, you know what you know it was just because i felt like i had to say something and it wound up being my most successful short film i've ever made and mm. it like went kind of international all over the place people were really moved by it it was a conversation starter and that's the first that was like i think that was 30 when i made that or 29 30 and that was the first time people in earnest were like "Ooh, what what feature do you want to make? There was something about that film. And I think it was the perspective and point of view that people were like, we want to see a longer form project from you. Whereas my previous shorts, my film school stuff, everything, it didn't garner that interest. This one did. I made a couple of shorts after that, uh, Monogamish and Unknown Caller. But Pog was the one where I started really thinking like, okay, what is the script I'm going to write? So I started going back into my feature writing i had written a couple features beforehand they weren't really the right ones i didn't really feel like they fit because again i had this like thing in my head of like i wanted to say something or that i had something to say and i started dreaming of what land of gold became let's say in 2019 pog came out in 2018 and land of gold started the gestation of it started in 2019 and again like pog was ripped from the headlines so was Land of Gold. I, there were these stories of these child, children separated at the border and this like very inhumane immigration policy that the United States was in, again, related to the Trump administration, but also prior administrations and you know current administrations have continued this policy. And I was like, ooh, this is something I can't get out of my head. I have something to say here. And then married that with my own South Asian experience and conversations I was having within the South Asian community. And that's kind of how I started writing the feature because I think I... I felt like I was ready for it. I mean, I had like a decade plus of production experience. I'd been acting, you know, I'd been making stuff. And it, I think it was finally like producers finally like saw that film and were like, hey, we would love to work with you. And that's how I found my first two producers for Land of Gold, Kirtan and Balavi Sastry, who you met, I think you met, you met Balavi at uh, yes, Benton. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they approached me lar in large part because of that short, because they had seen that and they were really moved by it. And they're like, oh, this guy's got something to say. Again, I think that's the thing, right? Like people are like, oh, I can make a, a horror movie and I could be really slick with the camera and do this and do that. Anybody can do that. You can go on YouTube and watch tons of tutorials and tons of like YouTubers doing that. And they do it exceptionally well. I think the thing that you can't teach someone is that they have something to say in a voice. And that could be in drama, that could be in comedy, it could be whatever. But I think when you're asking about the transition from short to feature, it's less technical. It's more, oh, the recognition that this filmmaker is ready to say something bigger. And whatever package that might be, it still might be like a super genre fair type thing, but there still has to be that substance there. And I think, you know, the short film is a great avenue to kind of test the waters of, do you have something to say and can you execute it? And then the feature is like, obviously the next step. That's beautiful. I love that. I mean, I feel like, yeah, there, there is something to say about, you know, wanting to like put stuff out there just to have it out there. And then there's another thing on the other side of that, where it's like, you, you have to have, like, how important is the why? What is your why? Like, why does the story matter? And like, what sort of impact do you anticipate having? And like the mission behind it? Yeah, what, Seems, otherwise, uh, what's the, what else is the point, right? Like, why else create? I mean, yeah. art is meant to comment on society, on relationships, on, on stuff. It's commenting on stuff. So it's like, unless you have something to comment on that you feel very strongly about, I don't know if what you're working on is going to reach the audiences you want them to because there's nothing to right. receive, right? And I think it, I just hit a point whether it was like maturity wise, technical wise, everything kind of married together. And finally, like I was able to encapsulate what I was commenting on and weaponize it, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah. So how did you meet the producers for the feature length? Was that something yeah. where they approached you or did you approach them or a yeah, hybrid? Yeah, it's actually a great story. So uh, Kirtana, so the, my, two of my producers are sisters. Uh, and uh, Kirtana, mm -hmm. who's a casting director in LA as well, she was at a film festival where that short film played and came up afterwards and just like was very complimentary and um, was like, oh, I love this short, like you know, she's very complimentary and I may or may not have invited myself to her birthday party uh, that she was having in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, Cause I was like, cool. All right. I'm coming to your birthday. <laughs> and I showed up and we became friends and there was no like work talk. It was just like, we just enjoyed each other's energy. And it was just like, we became friends. I had met her sister on a completely separate occasion and oh. yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know that they were sisters until I did. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is great. And they had, made a couple of shorts, they had made a documentary, and they wanted to get into narrative features. And they started reaching out to filmmaker friends that they really liked and supported that like they really liked the vibe of them. And they reached out to me and said, Do you have anything? And I was dreaming land of gold of like the first in like in instance of it. So we went out to dinner. And I pitched it to them. They're like, Oh, that sounds great. We'd love to read it. And I was like, I haven't written it yet. So I uh, spent my December of 2019 writing the first draft, like spent three and a half solid weeks just writing that first draft, wrote the end and sent it, you know, grammar, spelling, errors galore. But uh, they read it and they saw something in it. So they were like, great, we want to make this with you. And um, then, you know, COVID happened and I basically had a year of unemployment and like was able to like workshop that script and, and work on it. Um, we were able to get our third producer, Simon Tofik on board, thanks to a mutual friend of ours, Bavani Rao. He really responded to the script too and thought we were doing something interesting there. And then we were starting conversations to go out to production companies and financiers. And in that process, excuse me, I, uh, I have, I sent the project, you know, I sent it to all the labs as you do, like all the labs. And I've never been the lab guy. Like I've been applying for years and they always reject me and I never get any instant. I'm like, what the hell's going on? Am I terrible? So I, I was, but I sent it to this uh, grant called the AT and T Untold Stories Program, which is uh, in AT and T in conjunction with Tribeca Festival, and uh, we wound up winning the thing, which gave us our production budget, and uh, you know, we had eleven months to make the movie because we had to premiere at the Tribeca Festival the following year. So, uh, you know, the gestation period of the project was very short, but the and the producers jumped on, and it was sort of like lightning. Like it was like this project was meant to happen. And it was meant to happen this way with this team. But yeah, that's how they found it. They liked my short and they reached out. And that was the first time, you know, producers had reached out and been like, hey, we would like to work with you. And, you know, that is yeah, so inspiring. Yeah. yeah, that is so inspiring. And to hear that you were able to accomplish writing the feature within a month. I mean, <laughs> well, the first draft, was... the first draft. And it was pretty terrible. <laughs> first draft. It's, a, it's my vomit draft. But yes. <laughs> But still, I mean, there's something to say about being able to, like, you know, bring something, an idea to fruition. And even if it's a draft, whatever, punctuation or grammar or errors, whatever it might be filled with, the fact that you completed it. I mean, that says a lot. That's really beautiful. And then it's really interesting what you're describing, too, because we've talked many times with other people where it's just like the universe has a funny way of just kind of unloading everything that you ask for <laughs> at once. And then it's just like, well, the universe is like, are you ready? Can you do this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like the first draft may have taken a month, but it was like a year, year plus of dreaming and thinking, you know, that short came out in 2018. That's around the start time I started thinking yeah. about it. 2019 was really like thinking and thinking and thinking and then putting it to pay, pen to paper and a lot of friends, a lot of support along the way of like putting my, you know, I think the, the thing that I did differently with this project, it also coincides with like my current relationship. Like I started dating my now fiance around the same time. And I think I made this like decision in my life. Like, Hey, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I've been doing that for years. So let's change how I'm operating here. Right. Let's not work in a vacuum anymore. So with this idea, I started telling it about it to friends and like someone would be like oh have you read this article or have you seen this or oh, i thought of your idea and suddenly i was getting all of these different ideas from all these different sources from people because i wasn't working just like inside here and here and like you know twisting and turning i was putting it out in the universe that like things were happening and i was also putting out my shorts so people knew that i was like creating constantly right i think that's something that's really important it's just to keep creating and putting stuff out there because then people know you're making stuff and they're like, Ooh, this, this person is making something. Let's, we want to make something too. But yeah, you know, 
I think Pallavi and Kirtana and then later Simon and I think they're the land of gold story is a testament to finding support and community because you can't do this alone. And I think the only reason I've been able to get to the point that I am is the support of the people around me. And they're a huge part mm-hmm. of that. And like, it was the first time on a larger scale, like I had support on my short films, you know, but my friend Suchin and my friend Patrick and like my DP Chris has been with me through since college. Right. Like these are some of my best friends, my friend Julie, but having support in like from all of these places is what really makes things happen. And I think that's like not something that inherently just comes to you. I think you have to seek that out and seek those people that are going to support you so that you can support each other through the madness. Cause this is a maddening journey. Yeah. Deep, there's something that you said to me when we had coffee, that's really stuck with me while I've been in film school and working on my own films. And yeah. it was about, there was a scene in your film that I believe your fiance was acting in that you cut from the film. And you said that the reason that you cut it was because it wasn't serving the story because the film really wanted to be with your character and with the little girl. And you said that the reason that you had to make that choice was because you put the film first and what was serving the story and who the relationship we wanted to be with and who the audience was empathizing with at that moment. I'm curious for you because I'm going through a pretty tough editing process right now. And because you made so many short films, how do you make those tough editing decisions, particularly when you're acting in it? Mm, I don't. So, (laughs) yeah. Uh, So it, (laughs) it wasn't just, so it wasn't just my fiance. So I cut her down a little bit in a scene. I cut, everybody that was a friend of mine wound up getting cut in some way, shape or form in that movie. And I got cut too. Yeah. Those tough decisions, you know, look, you're telling a story and you're trying to tell, you're trying to find the most concise, clear way to tell that story. You know, if we were making TV, there'd be plenty of opportunity for tangents. And some people have seen land of gold and are like, Oh my God, I would love to see the miniseries version of this because of like to have more time with all these characters. And I take that as a badge of honor. Like, yeah, great. I wrote great characters. But like the wife character, right? I cut some of her out. I cut some of the mom out. I cut some of the, you know, these random characters here or there. Because ultimately, as you're editing it and you're watching it, there's the movie you write, there's the movie you shoot, and then the movie you've got. And I think your goal as a filmmaker in post-production when you're editing it is to really do everything you can to make it as concise and as short as possible. And that feels kind of like, that may sound like... um something that's like fighting the creative instinct and process because you're like make it as short as possible but what i mean by that is that if it's extraneous it should probably go and regardless of your emotional attachment to the people that are involved like as a director you've directed these actors you've directed these people and you know you want to keep them in there right you know but if the story is slowing down and it's not servicing what you're emotionally involved with then you kind of have to get rid of it. There's a famous story of Terrence Malick with a thin red line, uh, Adrian Brody. He got cast in that film. It was going to be his breakout, right? He was the lead in this movie. Terrence Malick, artist, big cast, World War II, goes to the premiere. No one told him that Terrence Malick had re-edited the movie and he was no longer the lead of the movie. He was just a supporting character that had two lines of dialogue or three lines of dialogue, whatever it wound up being. Damn. The next year, the next year he wound up winning an Oscar for The Pianist. He's fine. But I think that goes to show you that like it's your job as a filmmaker is to make those tough decisions of what's going to service your story best. Right. So like those scenes that I cut of the mom, of the wife character, of, of, of Caroline, of me, of sister-in-law, brother, you know, everyone had scenes that were cut. It was for me, it's always about pacing because like what is the emotional journey we're on what are we tracking here and if we're starting to dip and we like the dips are fine but if we dip too far then we lose what we were actually on the journey of and it's like then i have to get the audience back on board so i think i mean it's kind of an esoteric answer but you kind of just have to protect your story and you have to protect what your story Mm -hmm. wants to be because you may have intended it to be something and then it may want to be something else based off performances based off of the shooting style based off the pacing you know you may have shot it in a way that makes it want to be very like slow and 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 patient which means you may need 
less tangents because you need to really sit with what's going on. Uh, but if you decide you want to fast pace it, it might mean there are other things that can be in there or not. Then there's a clarity thing. So I'm I'm very much a proponent of like, you know, and I have a challenge with this. Like, could there be a could have there been a more that could have been cut from all these movies? Maybe I'm happy with what we wound up with. But like again, it's also then personal taste, right? Like, what do you like, and does this work for you? But um, I don't know if that answers that. It's kind of like rambling a little bit, but yeah. Like we said, we love a good tangent. But we never think <laughs> consider rambling at all. It's never rambling. <laughs> Editing is hard. So, I mean, to, you also said, like, you know, I'm in the film, right? So, like, it'd be very easy for me to be like, ah, oh, this is just a, such a good look. Like, this look is just like, <laughs> oh, I look, this man who's me it just looks so good. But the reality is, like, if I kept all those moments in, it would have fucking ruined the performance that is working. <laughs> I think it's like the lesson that I've learned is it's not about having every Oscar winning moment in the movie. It's about building up to the one or two moments because mm. it's a, because it's a long form story, right? With a feature and with a short, it's the same thing. Um, my short film bug, I was in that as well. And it all leads up to one scene at the end. And if you're still on the journey by the end, it's going to punch you in the face and land of gold is very similar. It's a very slow burn until the end. So, you know, when you're doing that kind of thing, it's like really like, okay, you can't have too many peaks because you have to get the audience to go, 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 go so that you can break them or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's really learning pacing and, and, and trusting your instincts, but then also not being shy of like, this isn't working the way I want it to work or it's working great, but it's unnecessary. I mean, the big cut from Land of Gold, we originally, I had scripted in a completely different opening for the movie. We shot it. And we cut it, I think we edited it 42 different ways and it just wasn't working for me. So I scrapped it and we redid the entire opening of the film with what we had. And it worked so much better for me because the original opening wasn't emotionally setting me in the right space. And it was like raising a lot of questions that I wasn't, the film wasn't prepared to answer which was surprising to me, right? Because on paper, that scene, people were like, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. So I had to like look at the edit, look at the footage I have and be like, okay, we're going to change this and we're going to be a little creative here. And I don't think anyone, m no one misses that scene for sure. I for sure as hell don't, <laughs> you know? I mean, and that was, 42 you know, takes, uh, 42 uh, revisions. revisions. My goodness, yeah. I think I'd be sick of it too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. My editor and I were just like, yeah, so this has got to get cut now, right? And we're like, yeah, okay, fine. Um, yeah. I love that you brought that up because I wanted to ask you, like, tell us a lot about how you direct yourself while you're acting. I find it incredibly hard, but I'm interested in what your take on it is. Yeah. So in my sh so okay, I mean, the long and short of it is surrounding your support is the qu is the answer, right? Like it's surrounding yourself with people you trust. So my DP Chris Lowe is one of my best friends. He's a director himself, um, great director. He's great DP. We've known each other for <laughs> over. a almost two decades now we've known each other since college and wow. you know we kind of have a really beautiful language together at this point where we don't have to say too much we just know what we want right from each other and i trust him behind the camera implicitly like we talk about it we talk about references we talk about the shot list the storyboard he'll show me a frame i'm like good let's go like it's there's not too much deliberation there at this point and that's years of experience and trust right Mm -hmm. surrounding myself with team members you know my upm line producer julie Persani is like one of my writer dies right i trust her to take care of the set and to take care of me with the shorts it was a bit easier to direct myself because it's a shorter form thing and i kind of knew what we had it was only like two or three days of production mm -hmm. the feature there was no hell no way in hell i was going to be able to do that because we also had a nine-year-old you know caroline valencia who's our second lead of the film gives a knockout performance and i needed to be available to be able to be present with her but then also direct her and then remember what she was doing because you know we had to send her to school and then i'd have to perform against a tennis ball or someone so i had actor hired an acting coach and it's actually my fiance kate kugler uh, who's also an actor in the film but she was our acting coach on set so the you know, it's kind of like a three headed Cerberus, like this three headed monster that helped create the central relationship in the film because, you know, Kate and I had lots of conversations about the script, about what I wanted from each scene, how I was building that arc and pacing it through the course of the film. 
and she knew what I was trying looking for. So when I was acting, she was my eyes behind monitor as my coach mm -hmm. and was like, okay, great. You did this maybe try this or, okay, you want to do this, but you maybe didn't deliver it that way. Maybe try something to do this. So like we were kind of working together on my performance in that sense. When mm. Caroline was offset, Kate would play Caroline because she was watching her performance and then would recreate it as best as she could. So I could react to it. So I could have options in the edit to cut them together. And like the greatest compliment I get in the film for me is that the chemistry between my character and Caroline's chemistry is so uh, vibrant. And I think that's because of this three headed monster. And Kate is a massive, massive reason why that happened. And I trust her, right? I trust her as like, as an artist, she's an amazing writer and director and actor herself. And like, you know, again, I trust her to see what I'm trying to do. And then as an actor, I, you know, I know I wrote it. So like, I kind of know mm -hmm. what I, what I need to make it work. And then it's about adding those little nuances that make it more interesting mm -hmm. than just like, you know, going by the numbers and giving you the, the the normal thing. It's like, what kind of things are interesting? And, you know, for me, body work is very important. So I had held myself in a very physically different way. And when I would walk on set, I'd retain that body. Like my mannerism slowed down, my speech patterns slowed down for him. I was able to click into him and then like let go of my ego of like, there's a right, like you were talking about, like what is behind the camera help you as an actor? With this thing, I was like, we don't have any time for me to deliberate. So it's just like, take, 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 great, move on. Average was about three takes. But it's just like, let go and just go do it and trust that everyone's trusting me to do this crazy thing. So, you know, run with it and, and have fun. So, you know, having that support, like having people that you've worked with, that you've trust, that you can build those relationships with, that you can say things that are not going to necessarily fight you. They'll make you better or they'll suggest things that make it better or easier. And then for the feature, it was having an acting coach on set and Kate was my secret weapon. What, ama what an amazing gift and congratulations to you both. Thank you. Same. Thank you. Are there, when are the, when are the nuptials planned for? Oh God. Have you talked to my mother? Um, <laughs> we're we're in Never the mind. We, don't, we don't have to continue that topic. <laughs> we're we're in the beginning stages of planning. Thank you. Yeah, hope maybe twenty twenty five. I think it seems reasonable. <laughs> Venues we're book up great. fast. Venues book up fast. It's true. Yeah, yeah that yeah. is very true. So I want to go back to um, you know, as you're evolving um in acting and slowly mm -hmm. blending into directing are there any resources that you would recommend to listeners to tap into if they're you know first time anything mm. Mm -hmm. mm. sundance collab is really mm. great yeah. they do a lot of great classes that are super helpful Film Independent is an organization to mm -hmm. definitely follow and jump on board because they do a lot of like development labs and things to get people, you know, short film labs, things like that. Um, they're great. Some great books like Sidney Lumet's, I think it's called Making Movies is like classic, like a Bible of filmmaking, the treasure trove. Watch a bunch of shit you like. Watch a bunch yeah. of shit you don't like. So you then you can analyze to see why you don't like it and what you would do different and do, you know, do different. Um, I would suggest if you love a film and you've seen it a couple of times, download the script and read the script while you watch the film and see what's different, what's similar, how the director yeah. interpreted the script. Cause like, even if they wrote it, you know, it's like the way you see it is different than the, how they did it. Or did they do it exactly as written or, you know, like how did they interpret that script? Um, I always think is a really great exercise. That's something that I used to do a lot. Um, and like, honestly, I mean, it feels kind of like easy to say, but it's like make something. Uh, I don't think you can learn all the theory you want, but like being on set and making something and like, Lauren, as you're saying, like, how do I go through this edit and like cut? an actor that I don't want to cut. You know, I've heard stories of people on features who've cut complete actors and you never even know that that actor was on set because they're not in the movie because that's what they had to do to make the film work. Like I think mm -hmm. making stuff, even if it's not like grand, like you don't have grand ideals for it, but let's just like, I just want to make something with my friends and like, man, these new iPhones, they shoot log. They, they're amazing. Like you can do everything with these new iPhones. Like, just get together, write like a two, three page script scene, two actors in a room or three actors and like whatever, and go make something and start 
exploring? How do you edit? How do you, what's your performance style, right? Because every director likes a different type of performance. And mm. how do you start interpreting things? How do you see the world? I think that's something that people need to do before they show up on set is start developing their visual aesthetic because it's a visual medium, right? You know, um, those are the mm. kinds of things I would recommend. Yeah, read a lot. Speaking of grand, tell us what it was like being the grand prize winner at Tribeca. And yeah. also what's next on your film slate for you? Yeah, that was crazy. It was an honor and it was a little out of body, if that makes sense. You know, like you make something and you hope it resonates with people and then it does. And you're like, thank God. But like, to be perfectly honest, I was in the mode of like, shit, is this going to play? Is this going to work? Like, are people going to laugh? Are people going to cry? Like, what? Like, I, I feel like I almost didn't even get to enjoy it in the way that you would expect to enjoy because I was so like, oh, is this thing going to work? But it felt really good. It felt like recognition that, you know, the last 10, 15 years of doggedly pursuing this thing in various forms was worth it. And that you know, I should keep doing it. I think that's what it really was. And not that you need that validation, but I think I personally needed that validation a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, it felt good. But I mean, this is also something I feel like might be good for your listeners to learn. Like we all have the dream of winning the Oscar or the Emmy or the Tony or the, being an EGOT. None of that stuff is going to fulfill you or make you happy. Because ultimately, the only thing that's going to make you happy is creation and keeping making it right. Like, you're going to make stuff that people love. You're going to make, you're going to make stuff that people hate <laughs> and you're going to make stuff that people are mixed on. And like any great mm -hmm. artist is going to go through that journey. And I think like the awards are fine and they're great. And I see it as a way to celebrate the cast and the crew that helped make it happen so that they're validated. Like, Hey, look at this cool thing that we all made together. But ultimately, like, if I'm being honest, like they're almost a distraction from like hmm. the, the art of creation, because now you're like, suddenly there's like this, like, metric or this rule that or like this like this rubric that it's like okay if you win this thing that means that you're a good artist or whatever and it doesn't mean jack shit like there are plenty of amazing artists that make and storytellers that make great stuff that don't get those accolades and we love that stuff right so it's like it was great but um i'm doing my best to not give it power because it's shouldn't have any power if that makes sense um yeah maybe not the answer you expected <laughs> <laughs> what is within your power to what are you manifesting next what are you yeah. anticipating uh writing or directing uh, as the sun, sh that? sun shines rays mm -hmm. on my face as it beautifully shines upon your yeah. face my goodness uh, yes yeah. the universe is saying yes yes tell us more <laughs> uh so yeah i um i'm developing a tv show right now that's an adaptation yep. of a, a manga and anime from japan so Christ. now that the writer's strike was it ended like a month ago, I got to get back on that thing. And, you know, if all goes to plan, we'll be pitching that in January and February to all like the big hitters and whatever. So if all goes to plan, that'll get sold and I'll be writing a pilot for the TV show and then hopefully writing a whole whole ass TV show, which is a a romance set in high school and the classical music world, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. And then how did you, you stumble know, upon the the. Uh, <laughs> okay. So during COVID, I moved in with my now fiance and, you know, I've had depression since I was 16. And one of the ways I self-medicate is watching anime. I love anime. I've always loved them. I'm an anime head, but I'm of the yeah. eight. Like now anime is super cool. Like Michael B. Jordan can say like, he loves Naruto and everyone's like, ah, oh, Naruto is the best and like whatever. But when I grew up, no one would ever want to have sex with me. Uh, if they knew I was watching <laughs> Dragon Ball Z and Cowboy Bebop. It's just like, now it's cool. Back then it wasn't. Uh, so I'm like socialized that way. So my fiance walked in the room when I was watching an anime. It was like a volleyball anime called Haikyuu, which is beautiful. And I was watching on this iMac and I turned the, the computer violently when she walked in the room because I'm like, oh, she's not going to want to have sex with me if she knows I'm watching anime. And she's like, what are you watching? God. And I was like, porn <laughs> because she's so sex positive that i was like she'll be cool with that so she's like okay and then walked away and i was like i got to introduce her to this thing that i love so i introduced her to this anime and uh she fell in love with it i thought it was a good gateway one because she plays piano and it's about a classical pianist put the things you love out into the world you know one of them will hit 
<laughs> that's all you really need is like one yes, right? Because you'll get countless no's, but you just need the one or two yeses. I love that story. Unless you tried using porn as a cover up for them. that's <laughs> hilarious. I mean, <laughs> you know, you got to do what you hey, got to do. I mean, those are teachable <laughs> moments. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, other than that, I'm writing what I'm hoping will be my next feature, which is a, a love story set in the 1920s between a Punjabi man and a Mexican woman on their, oh. on the eve of the Asian exclusion act. So we'll see if that, That's we'll see how that pans powerful. out. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Sending many positive and productive vibes. on, yes. that, on both Thank stories. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm feeling like the creative juices are flowing now, you know, like land of gold came out uh, on HBO max in May. And like, we had like a festival, like a, f a full year of that. And then now it's distributed and people can see it whenever they want. But like, it's taken me some time to like decompress from that whole experience. Like we said, it was lightning, but it was like a lot and very, like, it was just like zero mm -hmm. to 150,000 miles per hour. So now I'm like finally settling the strike writer strikes over. We'll see if the actor strike, officially will end or if we go back on the picket lines i don't know what's going to happen with the vote but um the creative juices are finally starting to flow again as a and so i'm like back to like writing in my notebooks and sketching and writing and dreaming and, and yeah hopefully something will stick soon so, dar deep i'm curious for you like you know writing can be a really lonely profession yeah. what are some like healthy habits or do you have a morning routine like what allows you to stay in this industry that we know is like full of lots of really high highs and really low lows yeah you know i'm i'm honestly i'm actively trying to figure that out for myself uh i think <laughs> that's like always changing you know we don't have, I mean, some of us have nine to fives. I'm fortunate. I don't have a nine to five, so I don't have a schedule. So working out is really important. Like I try and create a schedule with like working out and eating healthy, meal prepping, trying to do as the best I can to go on like date night and live. We've got a dog. He keeps me young. He's the best guy in the world. <laughs> but in terms of the writing, it's trying to do a little every day opposed to a lot every five weeks. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a vomit writer so like like as you said like oh shit like the first draft of land of gold in one month that's insane that is fairly normal for me like when i do decide to write something i'll vomit it out but there's been like months and months and months of dreaming and prep before that to lead up to like the first words going on paper so i try to give myself an hour or two a day where it's like it's purely dedicated to writing. It's whether that's dreaming or sketching or just writing random scenes, like nothing concrete, nothing structured. It's just all unstructured writing. Mm -hmm. And then if there's structured writing that can happen during that time, I run with it. And if it's like, if I go over that hour I've given myself or two hours I've given myself, great. But it's more just like I have an hour set aside a day, two hours set aside a day to lock myself with my pen and my notebook and just like train that muscle because it is a muscle. And like the more you do it, the better you get. And I know a lot of people hate this because they want their first thing or second thing to be perfect. But, you know, Land of Gold was like my eighth feature I wrote <laughs> through the course of like the last wow. 20 years. And that's the one that went. And I, you know, I hope that my next feature will be even stronger than Land of Gold. So, yeah, it's I think it's trying to figure out a schedule for yourself that works for you. And for me, that's like working out to exercise the body and then giving myself time to exercise the mind. But it's also like work that hour or two could also be watching a movie or reading a book because it's also yeah. about like, I use the expression filling the tank. Like you can't create if your tank's not full. So it's like refill that yeah. tank with stuff you love, stuff that inspires you, you know, the photograph, the painting, whatever, the news article, the book, whatever that is, fill your tank so that once you're ready to get like really down to the nitty gritty of writing, which is like, as I, I don't actually like the the act of writing too much. I feel like, Me neither. yeah, it's, it's like yeah. a, it's a fickle mistress, but if my tank's not full, I really hate it. But if my tank's full, then it's like, oh yeah. Okay. I'm, I feel a little bit more like jazz to do it. Cause like I'm inspired, you know? So I think those are the sort of things that I try to do. The fickle mistress. That's yeah. hilarious. I love <laughs> that. But please, um, on that note, what is the funniest, wildest, or most intriguing or inspiring DM that you've ever received? Perhaps from the fickle mistress. <laughs> <laughs> I won't talk about her. Um, 
<laughs> Actually, okay, so he knows this, so I can say this, I think. So there I mean, like, look, I'm a I'm a brown dude. Like, I don't know, I'm not getting DM'd left and right like that, right? <laughs> but with Land of Gold, I, I was starting to get DM'd by people, which was really cool, like people who love the film and really responded to it. The coolest one though, there's a rapper who I was a huge fan of growing up and still am. And he was like a big influence on me growing up. He's a South Asian rapper from, from New York. And he was one of the first like South Asian rappers that I was aware of. And he slid into my DMs and was like, yo, I just saw your film. I loved it. I shared it with my mom. She loved it. And I was like, this what? is awesome. Like, and I was like, you're a legend. Why are you DMing me? He's like, you're a legend. I loved your movie. And I was like, this is sick. And last time I was in New York, we actually met up for coffee and we've become, we've become friends rec- uh, since. So that, that meant a lot to me because not only was it like someone responded to the film and the work and heard what I was trying to put out in the world, but it's also someone that I have been inspired by, you know, yeah. and has been, so like, we were like mutually inspiring each other, which is like a really unique, crazy feeling. And I hope you guys, all your listeners at some point get a version of that. And I'm excited to have more versions of that. Cause like, that was, that was pretty cool. That was my favorite. That's my favorite DM I've had from Land of Gold so far. That's an amazing story. What yeah. a cool circle, full circle moment. Go listen to his so music. Next- his name's Heems. It's his name, Heems. Check him out on Spotify. Uh, he also has a group called Sweatshop Boys, and he helped start. Dot, and he was Das Racist. He's like this dude's a legend. But yeah, listen to maybe his we music. can add his uh, songs to the background of your clips that we put all over social media. That would be sick. <laughs> that, that would be, be sick. So... Yeah. So Nardeep, our DM of the week asks, if you could only pick one for the rest of your life, would you pick acting or directing? Guidance counselor. Um, <laughs> chef, <laughs> chef, uh, plead the fifth. Uh, look, <laughs> gun to my head. I actually do know the answer to this, and it, it would be directing. It would be directing. Mm-hmm. I, I love acting. I think I'm pretty good at it. It's so much fun. But as a director, I can tell the story the way I want to tell it. And I think directing allows me, look, I'm a photographer. Like I know I'm, I could have been, a, I think I could have been a pretty good cinematographer. I'm a pretty good editor. You know, I know how to do all these different things. And I think directing allows me to do all that with people that I'm inspired by and collaborate in this really beautiful way to make something together and kind of just be like a guide or a general or whatever you want to call it, like, like the leader of this group. But it's like people who are better at their jobs than I am and and can help tell whatever the thing is that we're telling together better as an actor I, again i love it i mean my heart as an actor is on stage mm-hmm. so i would probably pick directing just because it allows me to use more of my it allows me to put more of myself into something in a different way yeah. and work with different people in a different way than just acting would that being said I can't choose one or the other because I think one begets the other. Like, the, yeah. I mean, like straight up, if I'm being like totally vulnerable here, when I moved to LA, I had quit acting and my work as a director really suffered and I couldn't hmm. write a damn thing. And when I started getting back into acting, suddenly the ideas started coming back and I was writing again. And suddenly I was like, oh yeah, I want to tell this story. I want to tell that story. And I started directing again. And the directing got better, sharper, more interesting. Mm. And um, I think, you know, for multi-hyphenates, like y'all are multi-hyphenates, like I think it's hard to choose one or the other because they all beget the other and they all inform the other. And that doesn't mean we have to be doing the same thing on each project, right? Like I'll happily direct something I don't write and that I'm not starring in. And I happily act in things I'm not directing. But um, I like doing them all because then I can scratch all the itches, but yeah, gun to head, call me a director. I love it. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I appreciate that too, where it's like, it one informs the other and in a really beautifully reciprocal way. And yeah, 
it's I think that's really beautiful. Just different ways to look at stories, right? Like as an actor, you read a script differently than you do as a director. Lauren, you're learning this in film school, right? Like the way you Mm -hmm. analyze a script is very different as a director than as an actor. And as a director, you- Oh God, yeah. Right? Well, I'm about to um, start a feature that I'm acting in tomorrow, actually. Congrats. And um, thank you, thank you. And it's been really funny because I'm the lead in it, which is awesome. And I'm having such a great time exploring the character, but studying producing, I'm also looking at the script like, you know, I don't know about that decision. Like some changes that I would suggest, but you know, obviously like I would never, ever, ever, because I'm here to tell that person's story. Right. But it is funny how, like when you start doing multiple different things, like it's hard to turn one brain off and only leave the one on, you know? Totally. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like the, 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 like you'll get to your happy place where when you get on set, you just let go and you get to just be an actor and you're like, "It's, it's not my problem. I just get to be here and I just get to say these lines and move my, you know, put this cup down 17 different ways. Yeah. But then like you'll get offset and you'll be inspired and you'll probably write something new and you'll probably be like, I want to direct this thing now. Like it's, it's, it's such a beautiful cosmic mystery how this stuff just like informs each other. I don't know, Nardeep. I think I'll be calling you to direct it. Not really a director. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on today. Can you please tell our listeners where they can stay up to date on everything that you're working on? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Nardeep Thoughts. Uh, Nardeep Thoughts is where you can follow me on Instagram. And then you can see Land of Gold on Max, formerly HBO Max, if you've got that, Land of Gold. I think I think that covers it. <laughs> thank you so too. much for being here. It was so wonderful getting to hear about your journey and getting to reconnect with you. That's Thanks a for gem. Having me. It was such an honor to speak with you and good luck and congratulations to you and your loved one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> this was great. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Damsels in the DMs. Please. We are waiting for your DMs, your voicemails your letters of feedback we also are super excited to see you rate and review the podcast anywhere you access pods yes please do that as it allows us to continue bringing you content from these amazing individuals so thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of damsels in the dms until next time it's going down in the dms bye Bye. Bye. Yeah, we see them. Yeah, we read them. DMs, DMs. We don't need them. We just leave them. Please. Yeah. It's going down in the DMs. Bye.